Uh, welcome everyone to the August 18th, 2020 uh, meeting of the uh, Town of Walpole Select Board. For the time being, 7.04, um, we'll call the meeting to order and start as we do with the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, if you could please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I would also remind everybody that uh, we're operating under the order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting, um, GLC 30A section 20, the order which was effective immediately upon being issued um, has not been rescinded. State of emergency is still in effect. So we will uh, announce all members and will vote via roll call for each one of our proceedings um, as authorized under remote participation for public boards due to emergency declaration. Uh, with that being said, uh, and the time being 7.06, the first item on our, on our agenda for today is the uh, public hearing for all alcohol common victualers license for Gregoriatus Inc. Uh, Jim Johnson, anything to add here as far as the paperwork or input before we open the public hearing? No, um, everything's in order. Uh, this is the second one we've done with Ifa in the office. And Ifa, we're not right. missing anything. I think we're all good, right? Yep, we've received everything on this end. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thanks, Eva. All right, so uh, I would uh, hear a motion to open the public hearing. Oh, you're uh, muted, Nancy. You're muted. Sorry. Um, all right, here we go. I'll make a motion to open the public hearing for the All Alcohol Common Vic uh, by Giorgio Dialis, Inc., doing business as GG Pizza Company. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. We'll proceed uh, via roll call vote. Uh, going on order, Jim O'Neill. Aye. Nancy. Aye. Mark. Aye. And David. Aye. And Ben. Aye. So the public hearing is now open. And who do we have here? I'm sorry, we have about 18 people on here. Who do we have here for to speak to this item from the pizza company? Hi, uh, I'm Socrates Gregory Addis, president. Oh, hey, Socrates. All right. Thank you. I right, see you there. Hi, how are you? Well, how are you? <laughs> good, good. So I, we've seen you before. I remember you coming before us. So if you could just give us a, a just a brief rundown of, of who you are and what you're looking to do here, that would be uh, very good. Thanks. So we, I recently came in for the convict per permit to open up the pizza shop here. Um, things have been okay, doing well, and I just a lot of customers asking for a beer and wine license. You know, beer and wines. Hang on one second, please. Sorry about that. Okay. Hold on, are we there? Go ahead, yeah, you, you got you. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. I, this is my first one of these meetings, so I don't, I don't want to mess anything up by hitting too many buttons. So yeah, I got oh, a lot of customers. We've, we've, yeah. You know, I eventually planned on applying for a beer and wine license, so on and so forth, but a lot of customers have been asking me, so I figured I, this might, might be a good time to do it. Great, great. All right, thank you. All right, so we will open it up to any comments from the board. Um, we'll go in order. Uh, Jim O'Neill. Uh, I just would say uh, glad to see you doing this, and uh, hopefully we'll be there'll be a day when we'll be able to come inside your establishment and uh, enjoy what you got going on there. So thanks for coming here tonight. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate that. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Nancy McKenzie. Nope, I'm all set. All the paperwork looks good. Thank you. Great. Mark. I would just say uh, congratulations. I, I hear you're doing well, and uh, I think this will be a good thing for you. And uh, I wish you good luck. I'm I'm in favor of this, and the paperwork looks good. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate that. Great. And uh, David. 
Any comment, David? Um, I have a couple questions. It says that this um, license came from special legislation. Where did this license come from? Um, I can answer that if it's okay. Go ahead, Isa. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this is under special legislation, Chapter 180 of 2016. It was, I believe, five licenses in total that were requested, uh, three for the downtown area and two for the Route 1 highway. Thank you. I have no further questions. Okay, great. Thank you, Aoife. Uh, all right, so we'll go ahead with our, our vote. We'll do a roll call vote. <clears throat> on, uh, to close the public hearing. Yes, I would accept a motion to close the public hearing. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah. And I'll second that. We have a motion and a second, and we'll do a roll call vote first to close the public hearing. Jim O'Neill? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Mark? Aye. David? Aye. And Ben? Aye. So the public hearing is now closed. I'll make a motion and to make the application for the all alcohol common vehicular license for George Dialis, Inc., doing business as GG Pizza Company. And I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. Uh, roll call vote. Uh, Jim O'Neill? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Mark? Aye. David? Aye. And Ben? Aye. That's 5-0-0. Zero, zero. The motion passes. Thank you very much, Socrates, for coming in, and best yeah. of luck. Thanks very much, folks. Good luck. All right. Take care. All right. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the next item of business, uh, item of business number two under appointments uh, is the vote to approve proposal for shared street grant application as prepared by Tool Design. Uh, Jim Johnson, do you want to give us any background information there? Sure, just a little bit of background. Um, this is one of those grants that came up uh, over the last few months um, through the Commonwealth to encourage, um, you know, usage of outdoor space that, that's public. Uh, to kind of promote that, Ashley's been working on this one um, with a company based in Seattle. So I appreciate Kristen, and I know I saw Brian here too, um, chiming in from Seattle. Um, they've been working with us on this proposal. Um, I think I'd, I'd like to have them walk you through. I know that the uh, fire chief, police chief, and DPW have weighed in with some of their concerns, but I'm sure we can get into that after the fact. Most, most importantly, it's going to be the one uh, I call it the Elm Street extension there between the bandstand and the uh, flagpole common. So uh, that's kind of uh, where we're at with this. Great, great. So Ashley, um, what do you all have? Would you like to run through a couple of slides here, you know, for the board um, as far as what this entails for those three items? Yeah, that would be great. Oh, so, uh, sorry, uh, Kristen um, and Brian have both been really wonderful to work with through this. Um, as Jim mentioned, they're with Tool Design. They're through a um, like a grant for technical help through these projects. So I've kind of presented to you conceptually, and tonight they're going to walk through the more technical drawings. Um, Kristen, I think the plan is for her to share our screen with everyone. Yeah, just a moment. Hi, everyone. Hi, Kristen. All right. Are you able to see my slide there? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Yeah. Um, so the first couple of slides are just kind of, I think, a summary of the planning documents that we've talked about before. And I just, one thing. Uh, Do you want to start wanted, there? Or? Yeah, that's, so these are kind of the program goals, which I believe we've touched base on. And then, sorry, could you go to the next slide? Um, just our planning context. So what I'm emphasizing is that all of the things in this plan are, are goals and ideas that have been kind of supported through planning documents that the select board has adopted. And um, so one thing that I ask everyone to keep in mind is that with the exception of the proposed crosswalk, all of the elements we're talking about here are, are temporary and um, we have an opportunity to use state funding to really help us pilot some of these ideas that this board's discussed and talked about. And um, 
about improving in p pedestrian safety on Main Street. So nothing here is permanent and they're all things that if there are issues that come up that, that are untenable, we can go in and we can remove all of those things. So just want to put that out there and ask that you kind of keep that in mind as we move forward. And um, that's all I have to say. So Kristen, if you want to jump into the plans. Yeah, thank you. So um, I wanted to um, introduce also my colleague, Brian Tang, who's here. So um, Tool Design actually has a Boston office um, and I'm and I'm in Seattle and Brian's in Minneapolis, so we're all over the country, but this project is being run out of our Boston office. So um, yeah, so um, these were some of the, the highlights that um, Ashley talked about, um, needing a better design downtown to activate things, um, making a gathering space, having outdoor dining spaces, supporting the arts program with programming. And those are all things that the, that this, um, goal, this uh, grant program funds. So. Um, so she talked about all these things, like the um, improving intersections, activation, these from the economic development strategy. So now we'll just walk through the projects. Um, and I'm fine with you guys asking questions um, in the middle or at the end, whichever works for you. So the first one is the East Street Crossing. So just to give you some context, I'm not see, sure if you can see my cursor, but in the lower left-hand corner is the park. And this is East Street, so the um, parking access drive comes right through the middle of the, the plan here. So what we're proposing is to, to put in um, a formal crosswalk with a flashing beacon, a rectangular rapid flash beacon, and new curb ramps. And the idea behind this is to calm traffic um, because apparently people come around the corner somewhat fast and just provide a safe connection for people to cross to the park to the farmer's market to make a connection between the town center and the neighborhood. So these are the actual plans that we'll be submitting to um, ASDOT. So they look very technical, but you can see the crosswalk here, the curb ramps, and then we're kind of formalizing the edges of the roadway here with some paint. And then we're required um, for ADA um, accessibility to put in a, um, a warning surface to let people know that they're going into the street. Um, and some of the considerations that uh, we went through in the placement of this crosswalk, we looked at a lot of different, uh, about three or four locations on the street, and we considered um, there's some existing utility poles. We wanted to make sure we had good visibility. Um, there's some existing driveways. We didn't want to interrupt those. And then there's an existing bus stop. So we shifted the bus stop, I think, a little bit, um, but the rest of it all um, doesn't conflict with anything else out there. Any questions on that one? No? Okay. Actually, it's it's Jim O'Neill. Uh, ben, could I ask a question? Yeah, please, please go ahead. It's probably easier to do the, it through this, so please, Jim. Can, uh, can you talk about what you've done with the bus stop? You say you shifted the bus stop. Can you, can you talk about where it is today and where it's moving to? Yeah, Brian, do you want to jump in? Sure. Um, the existing bus stop sign is mounted on the existing utility pole, um, which is right at the edge of where we're proposing that 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 sidewalk pavement. Um, yeah. And um, the purpose of moving it is just because we're installing a new sign directly in front of that utility pole. And so we would just be moving the bus stop sign to the new sign that we're put this to the pole for the um, crosswalk flasher uh, and the crosswalk sign. Um, so that they'll just be on the same um, sign pole instead of that bus stop sign being mounted on the utility pole. So it's basically still in the same spot. Yes. And you don't have to answer this question because I'm sure we'll get into this with the police chief and the fire chief, but. My other concern that I'm going to want to hear about is the the traffic coming out of the center and whether there'll be a backup in between the crosswalk on East Street and the center that would cause that intersection to get jammed up. Again, you don't have to speak to that now, but that is something I'm going to want to talk about when the time's right. Yeah, so... 
Brian, feel free, free to jump in, but um, the way this um, flashing beacon works is that it's it only goes on when there are pedestrians there. So it's not like a regular signal that would just be on, on a cycle that would be continually, ask, continually asking cars to stop. So it's just when pedestrians activate it. And so they can choose to activate it or not. It might be that they come, a pedestrian comes to the corner and there are no cars there and they feel safe walking across and they don't have to activate it. But if you need that extra comfort of having the signal that you can turn that on. But I guess my question is if as you're, so I push the button and the signal mm -hmm. comes on, does the, is there any, any potential for the traffic to back up into the intersection? It's, a, it's really just a few seconds. It just allows people to cross the street so it doesn't go on for more than, I'm not, I'm not an engineer, but, um, you know, whatever it takes to cross the street. So it's, it's the d delay would be very minimal. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. hey, ben, can I ask a question right now? Please, Mark. Go ahead. Thanks. I, I believe this intersection was also supposed to have some work done by Pulte as a part of their four building development right up the street. Um, how is this the same or different than what they were planning to do? Uh, maybe Ashley can answer that, or I'm not sure who knows. To chime in, if I could, Ben, um, the three intersections that Pulte identified was um, the one off of uh, 27 in East, right near uh, uh, Byron and Mrs. Backoff right there. The uh, the other one was right in front of Eastover, uh, where their project is, and the third one was right at uh, uh, Stone and School, right here at uh, Town Hall. Uh, so, sorry, 27 in school, uh, right here at Town Hall. So it wasn't this intersection, because that one's right across from um, uh, where the Ken Tracy's barber shop is and uh, the pool supply place, right there. Okay. I do have one question, Mr. Barrett, if I may. Yeah, go ahead, David. So um, is this consistent with the look and feel of the uh, intersections at um, School Street and at Westover? Um, I, I think it would be uh, appropriate to have all of the pedestrian crosswalks and crossways along that street to look the same um, for driver identification so that, you know, they'll know it's another one coming up, another one coming up. Um, is it going to look the same and feel the same? And, and uh, is this going to be a, a, a calming hump on either of those intersections? Did I, um, crosswalks, did I hear that? And that's it. Okay, thanks, David. Yeah, um, Kristen, if you had a, a, well, certainly the first portion of that question, David, will have to look into. Jim Johnson, I don't know if you know, or Ashley, off the top of your head, um, I, I think that that's a fair comment that if we're going to be consistently putting pedestrian crossings um, on this route, that people should see and expect the something or similar, uh, the same or similar to each spot. So that's something we can look into as we go forward. So just my comments um, on that. It would be my intent to make sure that we have the same piece of equipment that we have yeah. right across from the high school and over near, um, uh, there's one near Ginjo, right near the old funeral home right there. So it'd be the yeah. same piece of equipment. Yeah, okay. In that level of design we would get into if the grant, um, if, if the board approves this crosswalk. Um, and then the other thing is this portion of our grant application is the most kind of what we think out maybe outside of the purview of this grant, so the chances that it get it gets funded are low. Uh, but if the board does approve this and we do get the funding, we'll get down to that level of detail and have it match. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you, Ashley. And then the the last question, David, I think was speed, was it speed bumps? Was the was last it, uh, are either of those crosswalks intended to be humped or like? Um, I don't. Uh, I don't believe so. Great. No. No. Okay. Okay. So I'm. Thank you. All right. Great. Great. Okay. Um, Kristen, please, uh, please go ahead. All Continue. Right. Okay. So the next project is um, creating some expanded space for walking and dining on Common Street. So um, 
the what we're proposing is so today there are two central lanes and a, and a wider middle lane. Um, we're we're proposing to to narrow the, those just a bit and essentially widen out the sidewalk by creating um, a painted space shown here in this kind of buff color um, that's marked with a white line. So essentially, we're just pushing the parking spaces into the street a bit. Um, and narrowing this, the travel lanes that will slow cars down. There's still plenty of room for trucks and buses to go through there. Um, and then that'll just create space along the edge of the roadway for people to step off the curb so that they can walk in a socially distanced way. Um, we're also proposing um, at the corner of Stone Street to revise the, the curve, the curb radius by putting, um, again, just a paint treatment with some flex posts and that will slow cars down so that as they come driving a bit slower. Um, those are all um, features that you know if, a, if a, a fire truck needs to come through in a hurry and there's a car blocking they can knock those down but you can see that we've shown the um, we have a software that tracks the turning movements of large vehicles and you can see that's shown um, with the, the trucks the fire trucks at the fire department uses and we've worked with them to make sure we have the right vehicle and talked with them about their concerns getting around the corner. Um, we're also showing um, in this dark, this dark blob here, <laughs> it didn't come out very well in this graphic, but a modular bus stop. Um, and that essentially, again, pushes the, the um, bus stop out closer to the street. It allows the bus to um, kind of park or stop in lane and pedestrians um, the boarding and the lighting of the bus would happen on that platform. It's a plastic platform, um, and that would get people off the sidewalk, so that allows more, more spaces for people to walk. Um, what else? There would be some planters along the edge of the walking area. And then in, we're showing in two places um, some parklets. The so one in front of um, Jalapeno's parklet or street or whatever you want to call it. Um, and it's basically taking, I think, two parking spaces and creating a, a space for people to sit and eat. Um, we can put tables and chairs, umbrellas, that kind of thing out there. So um, I guess the main things that I want to emphasize here are that we aren't um, diminishing the parking supply greatly. We're taking just a couple away, but what it'll allow um, these businesses to accommodate lots of customers in front and lots more walking space and um, okay. all of the alleys and such will, will remain. Okay, okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, and so I would also just refer people back to the previous presentation that Ashley had given us. I know this, that we've all seen these um, before, uh, but in reference to the parklets, and honestly, it's similar to what we're doing right now in front of Tessie's and, and Raven's Nest by bumping out with the, the traffic barrier and so instead of just bumping out with extra traffic barrier that we had lying around, it would actually be, you know, structured parklets with planters and new furniture um, and, and new items that are all funded by this grant, not through the cost of the town. So it's kind of taking what we're doing now and making it uh, look nicer, uh, more inviting, and certainly more comfortable. Why don't we, since everyone had questions on the last one, Kristen, why don't I just run through here? Um, we'll just run through the board members and, and see what questions folks have on this this item here being the second of three parts of the of the um, proposal. So Jim O'Neill, do you have any questions or comments on this? Yeah, probably a, a, probably a couple of both. So I'm in favor of parklets. I like what we're trying to do here with the downtown area. Uh, I think we've made some interesting progress as a result of the pandemic, and I, and I think we need to institutionalize that. Um, here's the challenge. We need to make sure that we do this in a way that does not impact public safety. So if you if you go back to that last page that you were on, I have a couple of questions there. But yeah, the one that has the let's start with the the bus platform itself, which if I understood you properly, I think what you said is that actually is going to push the bus or not push the bus, but keep the bus in the in the traffic lane as opposed to the bus pulling to the curb. So did I did I hear that right? Yeah, I don't think I expressed that accurately. You can see right now, um, well, today there's that crosshatch um, parking area and yeah. um, we are pushing that out a little bit, but the bus will be able to pull out of the roadway. 
stuff and the and a car could pull around them so my my and again again some of my questions will be answered by the chiefs but you think about the the fire apparatus coming around that corner and having to deal with that bus now pushed you know four or five feet out into the yeah. roadway and so that will be one of my questions and then just generally the, the question of the curb and the curve of the curb and what it means to particularly fire apparatus. So if we can do this in a way that doesn't impede the fire apparatus, I am really very supportive of it. But we've, we've got to be very, very careful here that we don't do anything that's going to, you know, stop the ambulance or the fire uh, apparatus from getting through there it, the way that they need to get through. That's it. Thanks. Yeah, for sure. So why don't why don't we go ahead and use that as a segue here, and we can go ahead and answer the the second part first, which which is the curbing, right? So, Kristen, if I understand it correctly, the the curbing uh, isn't being moved, right? That hat, the uh, yellow area that's shaded, and the service mounted bollards or the delineator posts that are breakaway, that's all just paint and at the surface level, right? We're not actually moving the curb. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. But um, certainly as, as far as the bus stop goes, I think we have, um, we have the chief on here. Miss Chief Bailey. I believe both of them are on here. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. I am. So I'm sorry, guys. We have like 20 something people on here. So I got to scroll through. Uh, chief, please go ahead. Um, you were, did you hear Jim's question? Yes. You, you want the uh, fire chief to go first, correct? Please. Yes. So uh, I did hear his question. So my concerns are uh, at the, pretty much the same as they were the other day. Yes, they made the fire truck uh, showing it that it goes around the corner. The bus is a problem for us today. Never mind with this plan here and pushing it out. When that bus is parked there, it isn't just doesn't stop and then pick up people and leave. It is there anywhere from five to 15 minutes at a time. And it's there several times throughout the day, and it is very difficult for us to make that corner. By pushing that 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 ramp thing out and any further into the street, um, I don't know how it's going to alleviate the problem. The other thing is, is that on Stone Street, where we're coming out and we have those bollard things that are going to be, even though they say they're breakaway, um, people aren't going to pull. Right now, we do 3,500 runs out of this station a year, and our main route is out to the main street and right and left with all of those runs. And Stone Street at the intersection of Main and Stone is tight to begin with. So when we're coming out of here, many times we have vehicles coming at us as well as vehicles trying to pull to the right. If we're gonna put bollards there and, 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 and even though they're breakaway, people aren't gonna pull over and, and have their car come in contact with those if they know that they're there. So I am concerned about that as well. And then going down through the center of town, uh, I'm just concerned with the 12 foot travel width uh, currently. So we're basically taking eight feet off of each side. So 16 feet to make the two 12 foot travel lanes. We have many cars that are queued up on both sides of the street, not only during rush hour, but during the daytime hours. Uh, I was out there at two o'clock today and we had cars queued up on both sides. And my concern is, is that if they're queued up waiting for the lights to turn, and we're trying to come down through with fire apparatus, they don't have anywhere to go like they do now. We, we would go in the middle of the road currently. They'd pull away to the right or the left and we'd have access. I'm concerned that we may lose that. So um, that's my concern with, with this particular drawing. Yeah, yeah, thanks Chief. And I, and I appreciate, I know that, that um, Chief Bailey and, and Chief Carmichael and, and Lieutenant White, and there were a bunch of people that were on the other day running through this as well and um, have been, uh, helpful in sharing their their concerns and and their viewpoints on all of this throughout the process. Um, okay, uh, Chief Carmichael, since since we're running through here, did you have any additional comments to what Chief Bailey uh, just said? Um, no, I you know I, I okay. what the chief is saying there. Right, what just one other two yeah. points I think I would like to make. One would be there. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's tight. I mean, twelve that twelve feet here in the middle is is very tight squeeze for Main Street in that location. One issue we have is right now, if you've seen some, some of them out there, the, 
delivery trucks park on that island. So any of the, we have tractor trailer units, we have UPS drivers, we have FedEx, we have all of those types of delivery services that that's, that middle island is actually where they park to um, make a lot of their deliveries. So that have to be something done uh, with that situation there. And then the other issue is parallel parking, which as we know, Walpole Center right now is it's all parallel parking. And as we, you know, as you close in that kind of gap between either side of the roadway, um, what motorists tend to do now is that when someone's parallel parking, uh, you know, they have a tendency to to pass them on the left and go around them. Um, and, you, you know, we routinely stop cars out there for mark lanes violations uh, when that happens. Um, but, you know, that's something to consider as well, that you're going to have uh, a tighter squeeze there still with the parallel parking and people trying to um, pass those vehicles and then sometimes, um, you know, violating those mock lanes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chief. Um, let's, let's keep, uh, Jim O'Neill, did that, did that satisfy your questions? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm gonna take my, my cues from the chief, both chiefs. As, as you were talking, one of the things that I wondered about is, is there a way for us to be not, maybe not quite as expansive as what we're proposing here? Again, I like this kind of idea. So I, I, I want to try to find a solution here. But you know what? It seems to me that one of the problems we've got is we're we're pushing things into the roadway, so the bus, the parking spaces, and so forth. Would we be better off thinking about sacrificing parking spaces? But that's it. So you know, you then you would only expand the the parklets as far as the parking space. In which case, that would make the situation not worse than it is today unless there's some other safety thing that I'm not thinking about. So as I just listened to the chief and I and, and thinking about how this would actually work in the 12 feet, Ben, I, I, I wonder if we're just trying to accomplish too much there in the street. And if we could just decide, look, we're gonna give up five parking spaces and that gives you the parklet, but, and you get, you lose the spaces, but, but, it, but we accomplish what we're trying to accomplish. And I, I don't know if this is a good idea or a bad idea, but I throw it out for the board. Yeah. No, thank you, Jim. I appreciate that. Um, Ashley, maybe this would be a good time to just briefly talk about the, the, the process. I don't want to get too far afield here, but uh, the process here with the grant and if we're awarded the grant and how we would then put that into effect. I mean, this isn't a, a vote today to say that we like this idea it doesn't mean that what we're looking at on the screen happens if we get the grant, right? We need to go through another process at that point to decide exactly what we're going to do, or maybe you could walk us through that um, and answer the Jim's question. Um, Kristen might be a better person to talk about like process and next steps. I can say that um, we're really tight on deadlines. Summer is coming to a close. The deadline application is coming to a close. Um, so we're, we're kind of in a position where we need to decide if we want to move forward with this application. Um, but Kristen, can you share maybe about next steps that you've seen with other communities? Yeah, so um, they really are looking for communities to implement these quickly um, and, and um, as, as Ashley said, they're not in, not always intended to be permanent, um, although you get kind of special credit for um, if you do um, implement things that could be permanent. So um, I think there is not a lot of um, time for revisions. I mean, revisions can happen, but the idea is that you would just, you know, put, put an experiment down. These have to go through a review process. Um, in other communities, um, we've had to have MassDOT um, district district uh, staff review and do traffic management plans and that kind of thing. So it's, they're not without um, scrutiny, but uh, for the most part, um, we haven't gotten a lot of comments and hadn't had to do a lot of revisions on these. Okay, and so to be a little more pointed in my question, uh, we're gonna be voting on this tonight because the application has to go in. So it can't be revised before it goes in. Um, the point being that if we vote and we say, yes, this is a good idea, let's go forward and we receive it, we're unable to alter what we see in front of us tonight, or can we 
work further with the fire chiefs to shrink some areas and enlarge others to make it um, more amenable to the to the um, uh, emergency vehicles and whatnot. I think that that it would be okay to revise, but I, I should just double check on that. Sure. Once you've okay. been awarded. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I can. Right. I can chime in on uh, another one of these grants that I've been helping with, and Please. we've we've certainly uh, we've certainly made uh, I'd say some 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 fairly substantial revisions even after the grant was awarded, and so um, at least what I have in mind as 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 I, ideas in my head for how we might address some of these concerns as far as making sure the emergency vehicles can get through, um, I think. The, the things that I have in my mind as far as revisions would would certainly be within the scope of what what's doable in the amount of time that we'll have. Um, one idea that we discussed briefly um, at the meeting last week um, was, are there steps we can take to ensure that there's space on the side of the roadway uh, within the parking lane um, where uh, basically ensuring that there's parking spaces available that people are able to pull over um, to get out of the travel lane to allow emergency vehicles to get through. Um, so that that way, you know, there's going to be some redundant space um, that we need, um, you know, to ensure that emergency vehicles can get through. Currently, that redundant space is in the center of the roadway. Um, and can that kind of redundant space be perhaps um, some short term parking spaces? Um, or, or even just some cross-hatched area that um, used to be parking spaces that are temporarily kind of, um, you know, no parking areas um, where people then the boom will be available for people to pull over. So things within that kind of realm of uh, uh, not blowing up the entire design, but just, uh, you know, changing what signs or how it's marked, uh, that's certainly within the realm of possibility. So it, it sounds Great. like, uh, Ben, you could condition your approval tonight for, based on final design review approval is, is what I'm Right. Thinking. And yeah, for sure, Ashley. And I, I appreciate that. I, I appreciate those specifics. Um, and I think that just knowing our board, that's what we would probably do anyways, is, is <laughs> and reminding people that this is just an application for an idea that um, we're not all going to wake up tomorrow and and there's going to be uh, it's going to be completely different. So, uh, anyways, uh, okay, very good, thank you. Let's um, let's go on then. I guess uh, Nancy McKenzie, any questions or or comments on this the second of three items? Nancy. Okay, can you hear me now? Got gotcha you now, yep. Good. Um, as far as blocking off uh, 27, well, not 27, what is it called there? Going it down to Elm? Oh, yep, yeah, we haven't quite got to that gotten to that one yet. We're just looking at this Main Street one, if you oh. have any. We're just taking them one by one so that we okay. can keep it orderly. Uh, so if that's the case, I like the idea of staying within the parking spaces. Um, yeah. I just feel it's just such, I mean, I, I love the idea of slowing it down, but the problem with that is, you know, definitely if we start having delivery trucks down there, um, that's just going to cause so much congestion with people trying to deliver. And that's actually going to then kind of impede the businesses and then make it something that people want to be driving around and avoiding. Um, you know, I, I love all the planters. I love all, you know, um, what they've done so far. You know, Conrad's got very inventive by kind of using over to the side and out in the um, existing sidewalk. But as far as, you know, making it more difficult for the bus or for the fire trucks, um, like that gets me concerned. Like, if we were just in a pedestrian downtown, I, I love the entire thing. But when we start to hear that, you know, we have this brand new huge ladder truck, that that's its way out and what's going to happen there, that kind of, it makes me worried. Yeah. Um, you know, okay. that's what I'm hearing. Great. Thank you, Nancy. 
Um, we will go to Mark. Any questions or comments on this item? I, I would say that I, I like the general concept. I like the parklets. Um, I, I am concerned about um, on the, you know, the last two slides um, about how much of the driving lanes we're taking up. I'm also a big believer and I'm not a traffic engineer, but that the more people you can get slotted into a right lane, a go straight lane and a left turn lane, the better. Um, because if you look at queuing theory, uh, people complain all the time to us, even during COVID, about the downtown creating traffic gridlock going both directions um, out of downtown. Um, and if we're letting fewer people into the zone um, and forcing them to single stream before they then take a left or go straight or go right, um, that's really going to slow things down even more. You know, So I, I think we really need to, to think about that. Um, I, I do want to ask a question about the grant. So I'm a little uncomfortable with this being really the first time we've seen any of the detail and needing to vote right away. Normally we would do this in a workshop where we'd have a couple hours to bang it around with the, the chiefs and you know everybody who's involved. Um, so if so the question really is if we do vote on this tonight to move forward with this, um, what are we really committing to? Um, if it's a concept and we're trying to get a grant and we want to do some nice designs, I'm probably comfortable with that. But if we're committing to actually do the things that are on this drawing and on the other drawings, I'm pretty leery, um, especially when we talk about the um, Elm Street Common Street connector. So I, I just want to let you know, I'm feeling fairly uncomfortable with approving a specific design but if you tell us that the designs really don't matter and we'll have a chance to rework it later, you know, that would give me a, a bigger comfort factor. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we will go to David. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing it. Ms. Losey, um, it, is, it mentioned something about uh, traffic calming or uh, reducing speeds. Um, could you explain how that occurs um, in this design and what the expectation is as to what uh, what the speeds are now and what those speeds will be after the calming takes place? Yeah. Um, so the so this is your, you know, this is your town center and you want people to feel safe walking and, and crossing the street um, and accessing the business. And um, the theory between, behind traffic calming is that the wider the road, um, the less um, friction there is at the sides and then drivers just feel like they can go quickly. So um, if there's more things going on on the side like street trees and parallel parking, um, and also the, the lanes are, are narrower. It induces people to slow down because they, they know they have to pay attention to what's going on in the environment. So that's the idea is that um, we would just narrow the lanes to slow people down. Um, and an appropriate speed in a business district is honestly like 25 or 30 miles an hour. They want to, you want people to be able to respond to a kid getting out of a car or people wanting to cross or, you know, a fire truck, you know, um, and then um, a big wide turn um, also allows people to move pretty quickly um, to, to take a, a, a turn quickly. So basically, we were just trying to narrow the corner, and that make, that forces people to go more slowly, so they don't just whip around the corner, and then they're right there where people are are gathering. So. Right, okay. and, and as a follow up with that, so. The current travel lane uh, is how many feet? And I see that it would be reduced to 12 feet. What is the current width? Ryan, are you able to answer that one? I'm sure. I have Google Maps pulled up, and I'll just double check right now. Um, I think it's it's actually either 11 or 12 currently. Um, but what's, what's currently there is there's the painted median. Um, so the overall width of the roadway um, is wider. And so that um, then visually 
looks wider. Yes, the, the current um, travel lane with uh, adjacent to the parked cars is 12 feet. Um, and then it just has that stripe median next to it that makes it feel much wider. And then once you get over to the intersection um, where the um, turn lanes are, as I've uh, labeled on the uh, drawing, the, those lanes are actually 11 feet, um, but you don't have a factor of the parked cars next to it. So, Thank you. Great. All right. Thanks, David. All right. Sorry, I had one more question. I'm sorry. Oh, um, please. No, go ahead, please. Uh, what, were the, uh, what was the response of the downtown business owners to the loss of parking spaces and to generally this design? And uh, did the economic development group uh, a committee uh, have any input on, uh, have a view of this and what was, can you summarize what they had to say? Ben, would you like me to answer that? Please, Ashley. Yeah, okay. go ahead, Ashley. Thank um, you. So one of the priorities in this was to, to lose as few parking spaces as possible. Um, so what you're seeing today is a loss of minimal parking spaces. What I've heard being discussed would potentially result in the loss of many more parking spaces. So that's certainly a conversation that we should have with the business owners. Uh, Destination Downtown, who has, you know, various community members, including business owners, provided a letter of support for this application. Um, I think that people kind of want to pilot things and see what happens and um, learn from those mistakes and learn from the wins. Uh, the EDC has not had a meeting and discussed this application. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you. Okay, great. All right, so before before we go to the third one here, I'll just make a, a couple of comments. One is, um, if nothing else, this overview, these two slides of our main street shows uh, how um, essentially inoperable the main street downtown is given that there's currently three lanes of space there, which obviously our emergency vehicles are forced to utilize because traffic can't flow through. So I think it was, was Mark and, and certainly Chief Bailey made the point that um, it's essentially three lanes wide, the traffic queues up in both directions and emergency vehicles are forced to use that center lane. And so that's a structural issue with this stretch of Main Street downtown that's never been addressed or remedied. And certainly having delivery trucks park directly in the middle of the street in the middle of downtown is another structural issue um, that's never been remedied along with the bus stop that's at the corner of stone street that currently is an issue um, for the fire department and has been for quite some time and admittedly moving a moving a bus stop even a foot uh, can take quite a quite a it's quite a bit of an undertaking i should say and can take many months but these these are structural issues and the last one being parking on the street and you know, we had a parking study done just a year ago that shows that the lots off of Main Street behind these businesses are never full. In fact, they're very rarely even more than 75% full. So the belief that we somehow need these spaces in the, in the Main Street, which is causing all of this congestion issues, not just with traffic, with emergency, emergency vehicles, deliveries in the bus, it requires us to take a whole new view of what we're trying to do here with the downtown and the downtown and this stretch of Main Street. So we should, regardless of what happens today, take those four or five items away from this. And, and there's certainly action items that we need to um, look at and act on as soon as possible because of their impact to the downtown. So with that being said, um, Kristen, if you could please just go on to the third, uh, third part of the proposal here, we'll cover that. I'd be happy to, all right. <clears throat> so this is the final one, as Ben said, um, we are proposing to close um, Elm Street right in the middle of the common, um, and um, it would all be done with temporary barriers. Um, we're showing some um, water barriers and then planters, um, and this could be done um, with paint also to kind of create um, kind of a more interesting space, and then you could put out tables and chairs, you know, lawn games, things that people can do while distancing and um, create this um, really special space, which is essentially right in the middle of town. 
um, it seems like a, a great idea for families, kids to be able to ride their bikes um, downtown, that kind of thing. So, um, and again, this is a pilot. Um, so it's just a, a, a test and it would it, um, include detour signs to redirect traffic around. And we have discussed um, the turning movements of trucks and the traffic flows and, and that kind of thing with police and fire as well. Great, and uh, let's go ahead then and just open it up. Jim O'Neill, do you have any comments or questions on this one? Yeah, so um, I, I, think, I think the idea is a good one on a very temporary basis. You know, we we close it from time to time, like on the on the night before the fourth, and so forth. Um, given given planters and tables and <coughs> barriers and so forth, how when when would we be thinking the street would be closed? So, Ben, do you want me to answer this one? Please. Go right ahead. So I think with this, what I think what you're getting at is this isn't something that we could set up on a Friday and break down on a Sunday. Right. Uh, nor, nor would that was their original intention when they closed Main Street and they got it all out there on Friday night and no one wanted to come back on Sunday and bring it all back in. Um, so they they just decided to do it full time on their Main Street. And um, from what I've heard, people have really loved it. And um, they've worked through some issues that have come up, but um, they've gotten really great feedback. And so this is kind of taking, you know, taking that as an example, except it's not Main Street, it's this side street. And, um, you know, I think that having a contact for community members and people experiencing this at the town to kind of get feedback would be really great. But yeah, this would be a more kind of long term pilot program. So you could do you know, two weeks or three weeks, and then have a meeting to talk about how it's going and potentially extend it. Um, the other thing I, I want to note about this is um, all of the furniture and materials that we'd be able to get as a result of this grant, um, we could reappropriate somewhere else in town uh, if we shut down the program. So it's kind of an opportunity to uh, get some public street furniture as well. So as a tangent, but um, yeah, it would be a longer term closure. Yeah, so that that would really concern me uh, because I, I just have a hard time believing that, and, and maybe I'm totally wrong here, but I don't think so. I have a feeling if we shut down that part of the road that that's gonna create, you know, just gridlock in, in downtown Walpole, nothing's gonna move. Um, it is a pretty main road. You know, uh, if you think about the flow from Common on to Elm Street and the number of uh, vehicles that go through there every hour, it's a lot. And having stood on that corner holding various signs many times, I, I know how much traffic goes through there. So I, I really can't see it as something that would be more than a very temporary situation. And, and then the downside with that, as you've already pointed out, Ashley, is you know it, temporary is is a funny thing those barriers would take a lot to move you get a lot of stuff here i i just i love the idea don't get me wrong i would think if we could make it work it'd be phenomenal but i, I just in my heart of hearts i look at this and i go it's a non-starter there's just no way this is going to work and and i really do believe it will cause gridlock and you know i, I guess again i defer to the the police and fire chief on this to hear their their thoughts but I know there's a lot of big like tractor trailer trucks that go through there. You know, as you think about it as a sort of thoroughfare onto, you know, what would ultimately be 27 coming down Common Street. Um, I just I just have a really hard time figuring out how we would make this work, even though it's, uh, you know, it's an innovative and creative and good idea, but it's not workable, I'm afraid. I, I think it becomes a question of priorities. Um, I also, there are like 200 units of apartments coming online pretty soon. So also anticipating more pedestrians coming to the area and hopefully not driving to Main Street. But yeah. Thanks. All right. Great. Um, Nancy.
All right. Why don't we go quick? We'll just go to Mark. Mark, why don't you go? And then we'll get Nancy back on here. Sure. I, I, um, I, I have the, some of the same feelings that Jim does. I think closing off the Elm Street to Common Street connector uh, is a big problem. Um, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, make it nicer for a few pedestrians to come down and enjoy this little strip every day at the cost of hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of people uh, who are Walpo residents getting stuck in massive traffic jams. Um, you know, because people are coming down common, um, trying to go down to what's 27. I'm not sure we want to force tractor trailers uh, down to the Conrad's intersection to make that turn. Um, we also hear from people right now about how hard it is to get out of the train station or get to the train station at rush hour. Um, and I think this will make that whole area even more confusing. Uh, you know, this is one of the ones that if, you know, if we could do some sort of a workshop thing, I'd really like to see a traffic study done on, you know, how many people really flow through these intersections and what will this really do to it? I'm, I'm pretty much against this at this stage, uh, just because having stood holding signs in June, uh, many days in the morning and afternoon, um, you know, even during COVID, I was amazed at how many people queued up at the traffic lights and didn't make it through the light at each cycle. So that, that worries me a lot. All right. And uh, Nancy, let's go back to you now. Let's go to uh, David, please. David, comments or questions on this third item? Sure. Um, so someone traveling towards Medfield coming from Common Street and they want to continue on Elm Street, they're going to take, their only option will be to take a right and then pr practically make a U-turn back onto uh, East Street or West Street. Is that is that where they, the vehicles are going to end up or is there an, uh, am I missing something? No, there, I mean, there's three options, right? They can, they can, well, it, it depends on the, uh, it depends on how it's enacted, right? Act. If that Elm extension that goes all the way out to 27 um, is also closed to redirect traffic, to detour traffic, then no, they couldn't take that left. They'd either take a left down by Bank of America or they'd go all the way down to 27 and take 27 around. But um, yeah. yeah, there's a couple of ways that that could work out depending on how we want to set it up. How the actual implementation of it. So you're saying someone from Common Street's going to go where? I'm sorry, my audio was a little off there, but. Um, so if up. you take a right, yeah, you take a right on the main street, the easiest way to, would be to go down to the light at 27 and take a left and just get on 27. Oh, um, no. But there's three, three no. different ways that you could do that. Okay. So Greenwood's going to continue to be one way down that direction. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, there's so many things wrong with this that I, I don't even know where to begin. Um, I have a question. Um, Ms. Clark was talking about Main Street in um, Norwood being closed. Where, 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 where are we talking about? Ashley? Um, the Norwood closed their, their Main Street area and to all cars and it's just pedestrians and they put up lights and tables and chairs and whatnot. Is that adjacent to the common? It's right near Lewis's David, right near uh, the, the theater there. That okay, Central Street. Not not a not an extremely active uh, pass through in that uh, particular uh, part of Norwood. Um, it's it's anyway. Okay. Um, the Stone Street light, how is that activated? Uh, I mean, the West Street light um, and the Stone Street, Main Street uh, intersection, how are the cross intersection lights activated? I'm not sure. Uh, do you guys, um, yeah. I think they're, they're controlled by that box at the top near... Um, Raven's Nest, but Carl, I know we were having some problems with that. That's where it's controlled, right? 
Yeah. Yeah, each each light has its own controller, and I believe they're on the cam. They're they're on cameras now for activation. There's no more loops, uh, magnetic detectors in the roads. So they're on demand, essentially. Yeah. Is that what you call that? Yes. Okay. And um, is it true that Stone Street and West Street are not green at the same time? They're green at separate uh, center, separate intervals. I believe so, but I don't want to comment too far because I don't know how integrated those signals are. Okay, well, all right. Uh, I, I'll, I'll save my comments for later. I wanted to jump in to just to um, clarify uh, what Ben was saying earlier as far as the three options for getting um, in the kind of Northwest, the westbound direction to get over to 27 from Common Street. Um, as far as I know, um, uh, let me just double check this. Yes, um, Glenwood is one way um, toward East Street, um, toward, you know, going toward 27. Um, and so that, that was the third the third option. So so option one is, yes, doing that, that hairpin turn, which, you know, would be a problem for large vehicles, but is, is certainly possible for smaller vehicles. Um, and, and then option two would be um, turning left to go down um, Glenwood, uh, which obviously we don't want a ton of traffic taking that option. And then, um, yeah, option three, which may be most appealing toward maybe some of the large vehicles or, um, uh, could be to go all the way out of the way to, um, the East street intersection. But, um, th those are, those are the three, um, uh, options that I think Ben was referring to. Okay. I have a question. Is tool design a, a traffic engineering firm? Uh, we have traffic engineers on staff. I am not a traffic engineer, um, and neither is Kristen, but we do have um, colleagues who are... Um, have traffic engineers looked at this project? Um, I don't think we were scoped to do a full traffic study, um, so I'll have to find I'm out whether... a full traffic study. I'm asking if traffic engineers looked at this at all. Uh, we, uh, we, we have not um, had... Um, any of our traffic engineers look at this. Um, you. If you, you want, yeah, we probably could, but yeah. Okay, thank you. It has been reviewed by three different engineers. Traffic engineers? Uh, no, no, no. Transportation. Yeah, yeah. No, traffic engineers? No, no, none of the, none of the, none of the people who have, who have, who have reviewed this so far are licensed uh, professional traffic operations engineers, but we do have oh, oh, uh, quite okay. a few on staff who put- question, Ms. Losey is saying that there are uh, three engineers looked at this, so I, I, I wanted to know, okay. I, I have no- Anything further. else, Dave? Any other questions, uh, David? No, I have plenty, but I, I'll save it. Well, now is the time, David. Okay, um, this is absurd. This is a complete waste of time. I don't know how we got this far, um, there's no way you can shut down that road. Um, first of all, uh, going back to the, you know, traffic calming and, and slowing people down. The concern downtown is not slowing down traffic. The concern downtown is that traffic is too slow. You can't get through downtown. The Stone Street intersection and the West Street intersection are on demand. They are on two separate cycles. They, they're never green at the same time. So anytime someone comes into either of those intersections, it stops all the traffic on Main Street. You are essentially now going to make the West Street on demand even more necessary. Um, you broke up a little bit there, David. Still with us? You know, and then so coming up Elm Street, yeah, people would have to take either a right or a left. Some people will take a left and go down Stone Street, which will increase traffic on Stone Street. Others people will go right and go on Front Street to get onto Common Street. This is this is a mess. This is there's I don't know how this got this far. We should be talking about uh, items that reduce traffic get people through downtown more quickly 
everything in this project has been talking about ways to slow traffic down in, in downtown. Uh, I, I just don't even know why why we've spent, uh, how, how long have we spent on this? Over a half hour on the board level. And nobody, we have no proposals, no concern, no discussion by this board in five years under the leaderships of, of Mr. Gallivan and Mr. O'Neill and now Mr. Barrett on uh, getting traffic to flow better through downtown. And what we are talking about is actually slowing down traffic in downtown and doing something that will actually create a disaster. So, I, you know, is it time to vote? Because I'm ready to vote. David, are you done? Yes, go ahead. So, All right. Thank you, I, David. Oh, Nancy, are you ready? Yeah, can you hear me now? Sorry, I had, had God, to no, go a ahead. technical advisor to help me. I don't know what button I pushed, but I did something uh, weird. The screen I was wanted to give you as much. And I couldn't see any of you. But anyway. I wanted to give you as much time as possible. So it looks like we got it fixed. Please go ahead, Nancy. All right, thanks. Um, so, David, I know you haven't joined us. But we have had a few meetings that we have touched on this. We did get a presentation on it. And I'm sorry, I did just hear Jim O'Neill and Mark Gallivan discuss concerns and actually back up our fire chief and our police chief who had concerns. And as you know, we go through the administrative process that they have their design review committees, um, meetings. They talk about this sort of stuff. And we have expressed some of what you're saying. So I, I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm just feeling like you're getting a little upset. And so to show up tonight and to be this upset, I just, I find that weird. Anyway, to go back to the design, I love the idea of doing all of the things that you're doing in that street area. But... I think that we need to move it to the green grass and move it to the commons and things like that. I understand that you wanted to like connect them and make them friendly and pedestrian friendly, but I think both of those commons are big enough that we can move that stuff out there. Um, I think what could happen here is what happens to poor South Walpole when there's a Patriots game, people will start wazing and they will start going through neighborhoods that to find ways around and less traffic. Um, you know, David brought up traffic as did uh, Mark and Jim, it being a concern, um, not as upset, but um, I think it is a concern. And I think that the residents and the neighbors around, and I did hear from some of them, thought that it would be a little bit more of a recipe of disaster for what would happen around it um, to compare us to Norwood. Like you, I, to me, you can't even you go over and what they did was made a really great use of a very dead space. That wasn't a cut through as far as in front of the movie theater. And it looks beautiful. They did like such a nice job, but we could almost do that on the commons and string some nice lights and set up some different, like a game area set up like a dining area and do that sort of stuff and still get this kind of furniture, but not take away a main road that if we're not able to do it just for, you know, like the one big outdoor dining night, truck night that the EDC has done in the past where they block it all off of one big, you know, finale for the end of that outdoor dining thing. But as far as commuters go, as far as you've gotten all the way back from Providence, you've gotten all the way back from Boston, you then don't want to have to reroute and not try to get home. Um, as far as traffic coming, I think there's a mix here that we're sort of missing. Um, we want it to be calm, pedestrian friendly. We want it to be inviting, but yet we do want to be um, our due diligence to realizing that people want to get through and get home. Um, so I think that we have a really great idea here, but as far as eliminating roads that are already heavily traveled, I think that we've got plenty of green, beautiful space that we could rework this. 
And that's my thought. Great. Thanks, Nancy. All right. So um, to, to wrap this up and I'll give my two cents is, you know, I, we could spend two hours on this and I think that it would be time well spent because uh, as I said, on the main street portion and this Elm street portion is even more so shows the structural issues we have with traffic downtown and the fact that nothing's changed as far as traffic flow in, you know, 50, 60 years. And that, there may not have been that many tractor trailers and triaxles pulling through our downtown at that time. Now there is a ton. And if you're trying to sit out in front of Tessie's and enjoy your dinner and there's 15 tractor trailers pulling through just so they can make the cutoff down through Elm street to 27, that makes the downtown experience less enjoyable. It means people will go downtown to those businesses less often. Um, so there's really structural issues that need to be addressed and, we need to shift our priorities. And I think that Ashley alluded to this a little bit uh, at the beginning of all of this, which is to say, um, for me personally, I can say that my priorities are not uh, to make it easier for tractor trailers to go through our downtown. They should be finding the easiest routes, the main routes that are intended for them. And if that means going on 27 the entire way, rather than taking Common Street and, and the cutoff through, then that's the way the town should have it set up because these traffic lights and these intersections and our downtown walkways should be working for the residents and, and not for any trucking companies or any else, anybody else that has to pull through. So um, I would point out also that um, a traffic study uh, is being considered. I don't know if it's going to be on this year or not uh, a, a downtown wide traffic study to answer a lot of these questions. I know that that's been um, up in the air for quite some time. That is going to happen. So I just want everyone to keep this in, in the forefront of their mind and think about um, how really messed up the downtown area is from a traffic perspective and how completely unwalkable it is and how completely unwelcome it is to businesses uh, who want to have open air areas out on the sidewalks. So uh, with that being said, I think we've covered all three of these. Kristen, did you have any other um, brief parts of this presentation to cover at this point. Well, I just wanted to chime in, uh, Ben, uh, you painted a pretty bleak picture there, uh, but I, from everything I've seen uh, from working on this project, uh, Walpole seems like a, a great place. <laughs> I, uh, and, um, and, and yeah, I'm, 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 I'm sorry that I'm, that I'm not able to, uh, to visit in person during these times. No, no problem. Well, I appreciate you. Kristen and, and Brian both spending all this time with us and, and Ashley and all the work that you have all put into this. Um, I think it's fantastic. And if, if anything, it's thought provoking upon about the possibilities that are down there. And I agree with you, Brian, I think there's a ton of possibilities. So I certainly don't want to sound negative about it, but um, perhaps more frustrated that we don't take advantage of those in a more aggressive manner. So mm -hmm. certainly something we'll need to be looking at um, moving forward. So we've completed uh, you know, the discussion portion of this. Um, if anyone uh, would want to make a motion, uh, we would entertain that at this point. Can I just add one last thing? Absolutely, uh, please. Yeah. So um, one one thing that we talked about um, for, in terms of common to go back to Common Street was that um, again, this was is just a pilot, mm -hmm. but um, um, typically I've, I found out that you um, when your streets are plowed that you put the snow on the sidewalks or at the edge of the sidewalk thereby diminishing the space for people to walk even further. So having that um, expanded space for pedestrians would allow you to store snow there so that that's an added benefit I forgot to mention so that would it would okay. keep the sidewalk white. Thank you. That's it. Great. Great. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, any other comments or I would entertain a motion if there was one. Being that there isn't one, we will move on in our agenda. So thank you again to uh, Ashley and, and Kristen and Brian for being with us for putting all this together. Um, I think it's a fantastic opportunity and frankly an, an opportunity missed um, yet again for our downtown area uh, to see improvements in, in this way. So we'll move on then to uh, the next item under appointments, hey, which ben, is the ben, could I jump in just for a second? So I, I disagree with you a little sure, bit. Mark. I think that this was just an opportunity to get a grant to try to experiment with a couple things. I, I think we all agree that downtown needs some work. 
I think that we should schedule a workshop at some point in the future and take a look at it, not under the pressure of trying to apply for a grant and, you know, try a couple of quick things. Um, you know, the downtown serves Walpole very well. I, I think it needs some work and I'd welcome an opportunity to do a workshop with, you know, all representative groups and try to figure out what we can do to make that work. As an example, as I looked at all the maps, um, you know, Front Street is sort of a little used side road, you know, next to the part we were talking about closing. And if we wanted to expand the green space, that would be an opportunity. So just, I, I would just say that I, um, it would be worth doing a workshop at some point, taking a look at downtown. I don't think passing on this grant opportunity changes anything long-term. And to, Thanks, Mark. to add to that, um, yes, Nancy. Rick, you may remember before you, um, Bob had done, we did a community outreach up at um, the old Raphael's and actually got all the downtown businesses to give us what we and they had wanted and their vision was in that workshop. But then unfortunately we had kind of run out of money and that's when we ended up really scaling it back and doing what we ended up doing downtown. Great. All right, great. Thank you, everyone. Moving on to the vote to request of uh, Matt and Nicole Murphy for street opening permit at 20 William Street, uh, which is currently under moratorium. Uh, Jim Johnson, did you want to speak to that or... Yeah, sorry. Um, I know that Rick and Carl are on this call too. Um, these couple of street opening permits, um, I'm not sure if Matt and Nicole are on this call, but um, they are. folks that yeah, come in and I believe that uh, they have a heating system that's uh, that's been worn out. They've been living the summer obviously without the heating system, uh, but they're looking to get it in before the winter to transition over to gas. Um, and that's one of the reasons we brought it forward. Um, you know, there is a moratorium on that street, but uh, I'll let... Um, them speak to this and the board can make the call. So, okay, hi, guys. Great. Hi. Um, I'm Nicole. Hi. I'm Matt. Um, so we moved to Walpole last September and shortly after moving in, Columbia had come out, um, I believe it was September 25th actually, and um, Shane Bagley was the one who came out. He kind of assessed the situation and had said since the gas main was so close, they were able to pull the gas in for free. Um, and, you know, we kind of tried to have it done before our heating system became incapacitated, but now we're kind of in a rut here. Um, when Columbia reached out to the town, they had said the street was under moratorium. So we're kind of hoping that the moratorium can be broken to kind of help us through this hardship because we really want gas. Okay. Thank you very much. And I appreciate you guys coming on tonight with us. Um, why don't we go ahead and we'll just go individually through the board members here with any questions or comments, um, and then we can have our discussion. So, uh, Jim O'Neill. So, uh, Ben, any, any, uh, any concerns from any of our department heads on, uh, on uh, the, the street opening here? I, I think I'd just like to, to hear from the, the department heads. Just um, to yeah. get it started. I'm sorry, Ben. Um, I know Carl can no, check go ahead. In, but I was just looking at my notes. All, all, all three of these roads that you're set to consider, William, Elnor, and Stone, <clears throat> excuse me, were all paved in 2018. So uh, this is what our, our second full summer into it. So um, if you're wondering when were, they, when were they paved. So Carl, any comments? I, I, I could jump in, Jim. Oh. This, is, this, is, this is Rick. Um, Typically, the Department of Public Works is not in favor of, of granting waivers to the moratoriums. Uh, the particular thing about William Street is, is Carl, I, and Drew Hand from the Highway Department reviewed this request, and, and we think that the request is reasonable. The only thing that we ask is that if the board does grant the moratorium, that the trench be patched um, in, I believe you people have correspondence relative to uh, this matter. We just looking to have the trench patched to the specifications that um, we typically use. Now, I believe that the patching of the trench would fall on Columbia as opposed to the homeowners. 
So yes. it's it's kind of a two part thing. The Columbia needs to commit to paving that trench in, in that manner. And and the only other thing with William Street is we look at the the traffic impacts. William Street is a, is a very lightly traveled street. Um, it's it's typically only used by the the folks that live down there. So it's there is not a lot, there's no through traffic. Uh, so along those lines, um, we would have no objection to the board granting this waiver if they so desire. And, and Rick, okay. thank you, Ben. If I might, so the the joint uh, activity with Columbia. What do we need to do to make that happen? And and will will Columbia do what you said they need to do? And if not, where does that leave us? I believe there's a representative of Columbia on the call, if he could speak to that. You guys can hear me. I'm Brian Gillis from Columbia Gas. Thanks for having me tonight. Um, as far as the uh, restoration for this service and the other services on the list tonight, uh, roadways under moratorium, we would be responsible for the restoration on those trenches. Uh, we do uh, all our paving the same day, so we'd install the gas service and be paving by the end of the day, everything would be safe installing a binder and top coat uh, within the trench. Typically, um, we, we do abide by the permit conditions that you guys hold us to. Um, and that's pretty much it. So if, if it's specified that we got to come back and infrared the trench in six months or a year, we will do so. We also, uh, we are mandated to do trench inspections on all our trenches. So we do come out and perform our own trench inspections uh, anywhere from 30 to 60 days, uh, and then also at one year. So we come back and inspect the trenches for failure. So any settlement, uh, any cracking around the edging, stuff like that. Okay, that's very helpful, thank you. So we would simply condition um, the, the manner in which we'd want the trench patched, Jim? Right. And that would be included in, in the street opening permit that's issued by the engineering department. Okay, great. Thank you, Rick. Appreciate that. Go ahead, Ben. Go ahead, Nathan. Uh, so this is our Pandora's box. We are usually extremely protective of these roads um, when they're under moratorium. You know, it's a, a lot of money, a lot of roadway. We put a you know, a lot of investment in this. Um, and we really, we don't grant these often. And um, I do understand it's a low traffic road and this is a full paving or is it a chip seal? Full pave. And so there's gas on the, on the street and there's no other way to bring that gas and no other line that doesn't involve another way into the property? No, nope. the uh, gas is located alongside, uh, so across the roadway. So we have to tie another gas main run across the roadway and onto the property. I mean, the financial commitment that the town puts into this road, into your road, into every road is huge. And every time we cut it open, it weakens the road. Are you are you willing to put a guarantee through the end of this moratorium that you're going to continue to be responsible for it? If we get frost heaving, things like that. I mean, that's the stuff that then causes potholes to your neighbors, potholes to you. That is what causes phone calls into the town. I mean, there's, there's a reason that we have these moratoriums when we have as much you know, as much road waste as we have and as much money, financial responsibility and financial commitment that we put into them. Yeah, I mean, like I said, we got the uh, pretty rigorous uh, trench audit program and any failures, we do come back and we have to mitigate them. So for the length of the moratorium that we would have on the build or for, a, you seem to have mentioned a year. Yep, so that's what our uh, inspection process goes up to in accordance with the DP regulations. Uh, you know, being a new roadway, I wouldn't be opposed to if it, if it came back as it failed within two or three years, you know, as far as taking care of it. So we have a, a lot better restoration program than we had in the past years. You know, we're pretty um, reactive to any complaints that we get from the municipalities. So 
So, I don't see an issue with that. Or Carl, when when is it up? It's five years, right? Yeah, it's five years, and uh, this one is two years into it, so they would have to carry the trench for three years. It doesn't sound like that um, um, Mr. Gillis is objecting to that, and we can make that a condition of the permit if that's um, the intention and vote of the board or, or will of the board. So my feeling is, uh, like, it is extremely rare for me to agree to this, uh, knowing that you have such a low traffic road um, and that you are without service right now. Um, but please realize that it, it's not about you. It's about my role to protect the town role, the town roads, and how much we put into them. And as long as um, Columbia is willing to go on for that full time, then I will give you my vote. Great. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, Mark. Yeah, I, I would say I'm comfortable with this, especially with Columbia Gas saying they'll take it through the end of the moratorium. I've looked at some of the work Columbia De Gas has done over the last few years, and they've done some really good work trenching and patching uh, some of the roadways. So I, I, I have a good level of faith that they'll uh, take care of that roadway and it will be uh, you know, good for the duration. Yeah, thank you, Mark. David. Uh, just to clarify, there is a gas line in the roadway on William Street, and is that on the north or south side of William Street? That's on the north side, so the long side opposite the house. Okay, All right. but it so that. Um, um, is there, is it better to go all the way across? I, Mr. Matson, um, what is, what's the criteria? Is it better to go all the way across with that? Or will the scene be uh, uh, struck by the vehicle? Uh, um, the, the, the scene that's uh, parallel with the uh, lane of traffic, is it better that it go all the way across or is it better that the, uh, is the steam location in such a place that it won't be uh, constantly bombarded with uh, the car tires? It, it sounds as though as this one's going to go entirely across the road so that the seams would run perpendicular to the, um, to the roadway itself. Um, okay, so so they, would, they, would just, they would just have to ensure that the, uh, the seams and the joints are all, they apply the emulsion seal to the joints to keep them intact. Okay, so when you when it's on the opposite side of the street, you have them go all the way curb to curb. In the That's trenched the area, yes. <clears throat> okay, good. Thank you. Thank you, David. And no further comment from me. Being uh, if there's no further discussion or questions, I uh, would hear a motion. I will uh, make a motion to grant the request of Matt and Nicole Murphy for the street opening permit at 20 Williams Street, which is under moratorium and will be, um, will be looked after or agreed to be, uh, what am, what's the word I'm looking for? Maintained. Maintained to the town's um, level of okayness until the moratorium is over. <laughs> I'll second that. Fantastic. We have a motion and a second. We'll proceed via roll call vote. Tim O'Neill. Level of okayness. Is that a technical term, Nancy? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Engineering. It's a long term. <laughs> Aye. Nancy. Aye. Mark. Aye. David. Aye. Ben, I motion passes five zero zero. Nicole and Matt, thank you very much thank for coming on tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck in oh, the form this winter. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> Best of luck. Okay. Moving on, we have a vote. 
to request Columbia Gas dispute opening permits at 13 Eleanor Road, 180 Stone Street, 180 Stone Street, 261 Stone Street, which are all under moratorium. So, um, Jim Johnson, did you want to? Do we want to walk through these separately, or what's the best way to uh, to handle them? Jim, you're on mute. Sorry. Um, Eleanor Road was paid by LaRusso Corp in 2019. And um, the other road was paved. What's that? Is that Stone Street, Carl? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Stone Street with Sunshine Paving in 2018. Okay. So 2018. Um, Carl, any comments on these ones? Uh, Rick provided correspondence to the board, and our requirements are similar to um, to what we just discussed on uh, William Street, um, and said uh, we are. I won't say that we're excited about this, but where we were, we will go along with it as long as the trench is restored um, to our specifications. Why do we want them? The services uh, through the chair, um, the services, and Mr. Gillis may add to this, I believe he, if he's still on, uh, but I believe they're service replacements. In other words, the gas company, these houses are served with gas currently, but the gas company um, must replace them um, under their own maintenance program. Under their own maintenance program? Mm -hmm. So what is triggering that they need maintenance? when they're in moratorium as opposed to noting when our streets get done as we notify them and then being proactive and doing it then is there a gas leak uh the, these have no leaks associated with them uh there's actually a four-year program that we just started this year is to replace uh, identified high pressure beer steel services with inside meter fits how about uh, that, you do that on roads that are getting before they get paved uh, this initiative didn't exist uh, last year when these were getting uh, paved. So could we identify some that are getting down on roads that need to be paved as opposed to one that was done last year? Yes, we can. But these are in our plan to, to get replaced. Uh, so within four years, we need to have all these complete this like I think about just shy of 500 of them in our Brockton territory, which is 42 mis municipalities that we serve. So to me, as I said before, I take our roads very seriously in the amount of money that we put taxpayer money into maintaining them and giving them good roads. And as far as I'm concerned, if it's not any sort of leak or any sort of immediate hazard, which then you have the right to do it anyway, I would suggest that you find roads that need to be paved or that are not in moratorium because otherwise, to me, we are doing a huge disservice to the taxpayer. But that's so as I said, there's a difference between me letting someone do this and me feeling that it, it's it's insulting because our engineering department spends a lot of time reaching out to the utilities companies letting them know we go through a bidding process. We do a lot of things to give our taxpayers great roads. And to me, something like this is not okay. Thank you, Nancy. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim O'Neill. Is, is there any risk to not doing this? If we deferred it, is, is there any risk to deferral? Oh, I believe you're on mute there, Mr. Gillis. Sorry, I was. Uh, I would say there's a little additional risk there. Uh, obviously, that's why we're doing it. The, this is coming out of the Merrimack Valley incident, uh, all the investigation on the gas company, just uh, natural gas uh, operators throughout the country is identifying ri risks within their system. So, uh, Obviously, high pressure gas up to 99 pounds in this situation uh, with the gas meter inside the house does pose additional risks uh, when the majority of the houses do have gas meters located outside. 
So it's been like this for 50 years, uh, 40 years. Uh, can I say something's going to happen? I can't. You know, it's is the risk yeah. minute. There is a little additional risk there, but I can't quantitate that. And are there are there any other houses on these streets that you're going to be coming back to us on in another year to do the a similar thing and ask for another street opening permit? Uh, I've not. I haven't seen the entire list. I'd have to get my hands on the entire list and sort it out. Like I said, it's like five to six hundred for the for the area that we serve down in Brockton, forty two municipalities. So I could get that list sorted of by Walpole, and, and uh, look at it that way. Yes, we do work closely with you guys with the paving list and replacement infrastructure before you pave and trying to fix these leaks. But this is something that just literally got rolled out in uh, little three months ago. So it's new to us. Uh, these are targeted services are going after. So, I mean, it feels to me like there's there's no need to to upgrade them. You're telling us that there is very minimal risk. And um, to Nancy's point, we just paved the roads. Um, what would be the problem with just waiting until the five-year moratorium is up and then coming in and doing it? Well, I would I would wouldn't be opposed to that. So. Uh, that's definitely an option you know like i said if it comes off moratorium in two years and we just push these to the to the back and if there's no if no risk then i i don't know why we wouldn't just do that to nancy's point and you know respect the taxpayers and the the money we pay in these roads there is a reason that we do moratoriums and uh you know if we can't do a better job of syncing up uh these types of replacements at the time that we're doing the paving then I, I think we need to respect the moratorium unless there's a good reason not to. So that's it for me, Ben. Mr. Chairman, if, if you would, um, I, I would like to address, this is Carl Ball, the engineer, and I just want to address the fact that that question was actually asked of somebody else in the gas company with whether these, whether doing these services um, is optional enough to let them ride out the moratorium. And we got a different answer. Um, so, that puzzles me because we would not have forwarded this down here if we had understood that this could wait the uh, moratorium period out. It, we were led to believe that it must be done. Well, you know, I just, if I could, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I, uh, I would want to know the answer to that question. You know, if, if someone were to tell me that there's real risk here, having, you know, ex you know get, having, you know, the experience of the Merrimack Valley, then, then I would think differently about this. So I've got now conflicting, you know, data that we're working with here. I, I, I personally would want to know what the real answer is. Yeah. Well, I'm the one in charge of these, so you're getting the right answer. Okay. Uh, we do have a four-year plan. We've, uh, we have a plan, uh, 208 to execute this year of the 208. Uh, numerous have been kicked across, kicked back to us to throughout other municipalities for roads in the moratorium. Yeah, so I, I suggest go find roads that you know are out of moratorium or about to get paved and do those and come back and see us. Yeah. You so know, we, when, are, when we're we are, All right. We are noting that in our plan, and yeah. uh, we're not going to forget about them. Those are just going to get pushed further back. All, All right. right. Thank you. Great. You're welcome. Uh, Mark. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm sort of conflicted on this one. Everything I've read about higher pressure gas lines, feeding meters inside homes says they should be replaced. So, um, you know, if Brian is saying they can wait, then I think they should wait. You know, Brian, if you want to go check that out and come back to us, I'd be uh, more than willing to, you know, hear any, any differing opinion you may have in a couple of weeks, but, um, I'm, I'm willing to go along with what the board's talking about. Do the moratorium unless you want to come back and uh, convince us otherwise. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Nancy, were you satisfied with your previous comments? I skipped you there, but you are you all set? Uh, yes, yes. Because the, and that okay. in the past, um, from what we've heard, is that when certain safety features are triggered, you, they don't even come before us. So if, as far as if it is, you know, a routine maintenance prevention sort of um, safety 
I mean, um, trade up, then I think that we need to respect the moratorium. But if you wanted to come back to give us the education that there is a higher risk in what that risk is, then I am definitely willing to listen to it. But if there's about 218 of these and they're all at the same risk, let's definitely start with the one, the streets that are not in moratorium are about to be paved. Great, thanks. And uh, lastly, David. Yeah, I have a few questions. Um, so I, I don't want to say the exact number. You said that these are high pressure gas lines. Um, are they higher pressure than the normal residential line? Why are they a different pressure or, or, or are they a higher pressure? It's the same, same pressure that's running out in the street. So in the town of Walpole, we operate one system uh, and that's a 99 pound system. So the maximum okay. allowable operating pressure would be up to 99 pounds. Uh, generally, you're probably only running about uh, anywhere from 60 to 85, 90 pounds. So, so does the regulator meter change the pressure for inside the house? Yep. Yeah, see, so the regulator's dropping it down to inches of water column, seven inches of water column. To seven? Yep. Not okay. seven pounds, seven inches of water column. So totally different. So if you take a okay. deep breath and ex exhale, that's about seven inches of water column pressure-wise. Okay. So the problem with these particular services is that the high pressure is occurring. It, that pipe, it, the meter's inside, so that high pressure is is actually inside the home. Um, so any any side any meter that's located in inside the house does pose additional risk. Obviously, okay. you see in Merrimack Valley that was different. That was low pressure, no regulators, but. The risk is if someone was digging out in the street or doing some landscaping and with a machine and pulled that service. Well, usually when it gets pulled in, out in the yard or in the street, you're, you're literally separating it from uh, the serve, could be the meter fit inside of a house piping. So you could potentially have uh, high pressure gas going into the house pretty quickly. Absolutely. And I, I appreciate that Columbia Gas is doing this and that they're recognizing that these. Uh, need to be retrofitted and, and, and taken out of the homes. And I would, um, I would uh, support uh, doing this uh, immediately and, and, and absolutely doing all of the other. I, I, I'm sure you have a number of other ones where you haven't had to come to this board to do that changeover. And you have those to work on as well. Um, I, I, I hope you actually make ours a priority and, and get uh, all of them done. Um, including the ones here and and therefore i would uh i would move to uh to allow columbia gas to uh, uh have an exception for the moratorium for uh these properties okay we have a motion is there a second no second I don't have anything to add to the discussion. I would entertain any other motions uh, if the board, board would want to put them forward. And if I could. Please. So just before we go ahead with the next motion, I just want to go back to Brian one more time. And if you thought there was risk here, you would change those meters today. You wouldn't come to us. You'd go and change them if you thought there was risk. Is that true? Correct. So I, I can only avoid coming to you guys uh, without getting approval for cutting the road under moratorium. Technically, if it was a, if if it was an existing leak out there. So if it was a grade one or even a two plus, we have to act on a grade one leak immediately on the spot. Two plus, we got a, uh, I think it's 30 days now or 21 days to remediate that. Or else we're following the normal process of filing for a permit. Uh, getting approval from you guys to go cut the roadway and then going out and acting on the uh, job. And so you're satisfied that we can wait until the moratorium is up without undue risk? Well, uh, it's a tough question. Uh, like I said, we got four, it's a four year plan. 
So if the risk was tremendous, would have to, would be doing all of the four year plan right now immediately. So that's why it's dispersed amongst four years. Uh, if you guys deny it, then there's really not much I can do other than wait the wait until the road become, comes out of moratorium. Uh, the services have been in place for years historically. Um, I don't know the years on some of these, probably in the 50s. Uh, the main out on this particular street. Uh, sorry, I'm back on one of the other projects. Probably in the 50s. So some old infrastructure. Historically, that's how they were done. They've been like that for a while. Ben and Jim, um, not to cut you off, Brian, but do you mind if we table this and just Carl, me and Rick can get together with Brian and I get what Jim's getting to yeah. and I understand the, where David's coming from. I'm concerned with risk, obviously. I don't want to be in the same situation as the town managers in Andover and North Andover, uh, if something were to happen. So could we just, would you mind tabling it until 9-1 and we bring it back if, and we work with Brian on this? Please, yeah, just, please yeah. do that. I, please. I was going to say, I like you. the motion, but are there other ones on those streets? Like, does <coughs> Eleanor and does um, Stone Street have other services? I would have to look. So what I can do is get my hands on that, that full list. I've only seen the 208 that we were supplied for this, this season. Uh, so I can get that full list, sort it by wall full. And we can come back and get together uh, and look at those specific locations. Yeah, but that full the, list would have all those inside high pressure meter fits that are beer steel. Right. So you're telling me you got this year's list, and so next year's list could have their neighbors. Potentially, but what we've been finding as we're doing these the past two months, we've been start we started these as. They've been all coming in in like groups together. So we've been out on the same street like day after day doing the neighbors. But yeah, question, we yeah. would have to get you a little more research to get you an accurate answer on that. Yeah, yeah I, would, I think that's what we want to see that they were based on priority. And I would want to see them actually done in the same neighborhood so that every summer you're not just going back to a different neighborhood that the same neighborhood and ripping it up yep. as opposed okay. to doing them in groups yeah i think we can just go back jim and and get additional information you know from the from the company get an organized plan on it with carl and, and everybody sounds like a good idea okay so well, we're, we're back on the night sorry nancy oh i'll make a motion to table this to our next meeting second we have a motion and a second. We will do a roll call vote, as is our want. Jim O'Neill. Aye. Nancy. Aye. Mark. Aye. David. Aye. Ben, aye. So five zero zero. The motion passes to table this until our next meeting. All right, moving forward. Thank you, guys. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Gillis. Appreciate your uh, information. Anything you need, thank you for to work with you guys. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Uh, moving to new business, first item discussion uh, on the proposed warrant articles. Uh, Jim Johnson, you want to walk us through what you, what you had in mind there, which articles we'd like to discuss? Sure. Um, if you if you like, if you um, I'd like to just quickly run through the articles, give the board a quick update on a couple of them, you know. And um, obviously, this is really the, we're closing the warrant tonight. They need to be vetted by council, which I'm hoping she can get me back, um, you know, within the next two weeks or so. My biggest concern, and I'm going to recommend that the board not sign this until um, I really don't know when we're going to have a town meeting. Um, I've reached out to Dan. We talked on Friday. He hasn't made the call on this one yet. Uh, the way I think we're, we're standing is two options, really. Um, have it on the town, uh, the football field, like we did uh, this past spring, which worked out pretty well on a Saturday. I've gone forward and booked all the Saturdays in October for the uh, high school football field, and uh, also Sundays, too. Um, and have it there or do it virtually. 
I just don't think right now um, the town meetings are exempt, but I think we need to be setting examples with the whole town. And I don't think it'd be a great idea to get uh, 200, 225 people in a, a room uh, with the current standards. We did the math a couple of weeks ago, really only 83 people could fit in the high school auditorium. That's really the biggest space we have available to us. So it's, I think it's either going to be held virtually or on the football field at some point. And Dan, let me know. He's going to make the call. Um, he and I are actually sitting on a webinar tomorrow uh, with some other town managers and moderators. So more to come on that. But um, so just to kind of run down the list, um, we obviously have the um, operational budget adjustment that's under Article 2. Um, that's the in-year budget adjustment for FY21. Um, right now, I think I might see a couple of small things. Uh, I think Liz may need something uh, to do with early voting. Again, they've expanded that a little bit more. I think I think Tim Bailey mentioned something to me. We're watching everything pretty close as far as budget adjustments. Um, the Article Three is grouping all of uh, the collective bargaining agreements and the um, salary schedule into one article. It's something a little different. It meets the requirements of the charter. We're going to make every uh, contract available. Um, prior to town meeting, let the town meeting members see the MOAs and the changes that have been made, but we're going to just group everything into one article. Uh, then we get into the capital articles, which are all pretty standard, uh, the infrastructure, the highways, uh, the, sorry, the roads and the um, equipment purchases, and then the borrowing for the roads. Um, again, all pretty standard right now, I'm recommending just about uh, 1.2 million or so um, be used on on those purchases and everything. We capital started meeting tonight, so um, we should have a report from them in a couple of weeks. Um, and then we get into uh, stabilization and OPEB. Uh, I am recommending a substantial amount of money be placed in stabilization, just about 3.5% of our, our operating budget. So that'll lift stabilization up to uh, almost $9 million, which gets us close to uh, uh, about almost 10%, a little bit more than nine or so percent uh, of our operating because everyone, we just don't know what's happening as far as the, the state and everything. I think it'd be best to put a lot of money away in our savings. Uh, we have the ability to do it. Um, OPEB, just about right now, my recommendation is about 327000 going into stabilization. Uh, sorry, OPEB. Uh, Article 10 gets into the Medicaid reimbursements, the McKinney-Vinto um reimbursement in the the student parking reimbursements uh the assessors are looking for a consultant to um bring on to do uh, their state mandated certification program we have the peg access which wasn't addressed in the, the uh fall the spring because uh obviously we only get to three articles there and cable needs some money to operate and then we get into the inclusionary zoning bylaws and I'd like to just say, as far as the zoning bylaws, we're going to refer those to the planning board as quickly as possible. Uh, we have a letter ready to go just so we meet all the requirements and everything. Uh, so that gets into that article. Um, then we have the, um, the stretch code, uh, which was again on the spring town meeting. Uh, we didn't act on that, but no changes there. That's something your board, um, was comfortable with back uh, last winter, and I'm assuming you're gonna be comfortable with it again. Um, <clears throat> the next article is uh, just expanding uh, the requirement for limited site plan review to allow outdoor dining and enter uh, entertainment a little bit there. Just mostly branches off of what we've been doing uh, the last uh, couple of months here uh, on a less informal process. It requires basically a, a limited site plan, which is a site plan where Myself, Ashley, uh, Mike Yanovich, and the department heads get together with the uh, mostly people like uh, the Raven's Nest or Crisp or Jalapenos and look look to see what we can improve by expanding their little footprint outside. Ashley, did I miss anything big on that one? Ashley kind of put that one together. Okay. She's shaking her head no. Thank you. A um, couple of street acceptances. Carl's still working on those uh, to finalize everything, but um, we grouped those into one article more or less just to streamline things a little bit there uh we get uh then we get into some of the citizens petitions which this year we have five of them um three of them are, we're familiar with one of them was proposed from cindy hogue which is the stadium event parking um two were proposed from richard peeler which were on the spring uh, town meeting warrant 
Richard also proposed another one uh, regarding uh, Norfolk County and taking the pension system um, and putting it into the state system and also um, taking all the uh, town employees and putting them into the GIC system. And the other citizen petition was uh, for Harwood Engineering. They're proposing a solar farm down off of uh, South Street. I think that's a seems like a pretty good project from what I've seen. I've worked, with, I've had a couple of meetings with those people. Nothing's really around there, and um, it's uh, they're looking to just more or less expand on there with without having to do a housing project or anything. It seems like a good project. So overall, that's kind of a thirty thousand foot view on these articles. Uh, much more to come, but uh, Ben, do you want to ask if anybody has any questions? Yeah. Actually? Yeah. Let's. Yeah. So I, I had asked him to to run through all of that, not only for information for us and everybody watching, um, but also to talk a little bit about it and answer questions. So why don't we just go, Nancy? Please <laughs> go ahead. Um, so a few things about it. Um, stabilization. I think the climate that's going on, obvious, is such a great idea and you know jim you your financial team has done a great job i know a few years ago it was you know the hot topic of you know why do we save so much for rainy days well the never event guess what it's here and i think all of you have been doing such a fabulous job i mean there are families in town that have been fed there are seniors that are being looked out for there are town workers you know, we are keeping the economy going and that is the most important thing. And you guys have done a tremendous job. And then as far as the restaurants and, you know, Ashley um, building, permitting, everybody has done an amazing job. I mean, you know, there are small businesses. They are what keep our town going. And I think the you know, support that we have given them to be able to just go right ahead and keep their business going and fit into the constantly changing parameters have been awesome. I'm I'm sure though, the one thing that I still think is a little bit bizarro is the, you know, drinks to go in a cup. That, I'm sure Chief, you think that's kind of a weird thing too, but whatever, 2020 um, is weird. And um, that um, otherwise just, you know, catching up with site plans and making sure everybody's got room and even neighbors helping neighbors. You know, I heard uh, for Bobby Conrad, the bank has reached out and helped him to do it. You know, jalapenos, we have helped them with sidewalk space, the DPW just moving things around to get everybody. Um, I think what everybody in this town has done for each other and to keep business going and just to be business friendly is amazing. Then when we get over to one thing although about stadium parking, um, you know, years ago when I was at the PAC at Boyden School, I was there in front of town meeting and trying to push this along and get that parking because I think it's an excellent way to make revenue. I'm so excited that the church is doing this. Um, you know, I, I had reached out and said if they needed any help, I'd be happy to help them because I'd been down this road trying to do this for them before, well, for the school. But, um, you know, we all need to, South Walpole feels that impact. And if that can help the church, you know, I think it's important and we're all neighbors and we've got to do that. Then as far as the citizens petition for pension, I mean, I understand that people want to help out and stuff like that, but year after year, your team, Jim, has done such a great job of going with the best idea. Um, as far as financially being backed up. So the citizens petition, I just, I feel like we just went down this road and not to mention with contracts and things like that it, to be in breach of contracts. Um, I just, I have some trouble with that, but otherwise, I mean, considering everything else that's going on, you guys are staying on top of everything. You guys are every there every there every day getting your job done and it, it's very impressive and the people in this town have been able to reach out to all of you guys and it's amazing that's my soapbox thank you nancy jim o'neill yeah without uh repeating everything nancy said uh which i totally agree with i'll hit on stabilization which is obviously critical for the reasons Nancy has has raised. I also like the uh, stadium uh, parking overlay. 
uh, that just makes a lot of sense to me. And, and it's, it's a simple thing for us to do. And, and so I'm, I'm very much supportive of that. Uh, there's a lot of deja vu in this uh, warrant because so much of it was deferred from the prior town meeting as we tried to you know, really simplify the, the town meeting we just had. Um, so much of this is, is, uh, is similar to us or the same to us. Uh, I think the uh, your point, Jim, on the uh, inclusionary zoning bylaw and getting that to planning board ASAP is a very good idea just to make sure that we have no, you know, protocol snafus here. And, uh, you know, it's a it's a good looking warrant. There's a lot of a lot of stuff for us to debate in here. I'm sure the FinCon will be taking it up, you know, in the not too distant future. And uh, I look forward to the debate. So uh, thank you for taking us through that, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Mark? I think Jim and Nancy did a good job summarizing what's on the warrant. And uh, I look forward to having a discussion on all those items. Yeah. Okay. And uh, David? Yes, um, I had several comments. One is that perhaps uh, to reach out to Mr. Kraft and see on an away uh, football weekend if we might be able to use his covered football field. Uh, for a location for our meeting that um, is a possibility to have it outside the confines of the town of Walpole. The second thing is um, I would like to um, reiterate what I said in the spring regarding um, town meeting and in that if we can perhaps create along with Walpole Media a uh, little uh, a, a list server, an internet, uh, a a packet of videos for each warrant item that shows all of the, for instance, for the inclusionary zoning uh, uh, item, have a spot on our website where a town meeting member can click on that and see uh, lists of all of the, the meetings that occurred uh, in regards to it with uh, videos attached, with minutes and agendas attached so that um, as many of those questions can be answered by uh, the town meeting members and ask town meeting members to do a little more of their homework. Um, sorry, hold on. Uh, a little more of homework at home by uh, accessing these files um, having documents in these files and um, reports and things like that. So, and an opportunity to, to ask questions on the, in that area so that um, town meeting members can have before the meeting um, uh, access to uh, a lot more information. And if they have a question and have, have the town answer that question in this file area. And so that town meeting members uh, can have a lot of their uh, questions addressed before the meeting uh, even occurs. Um, I think that would speed things up. And also, um, especially if we have an outdoor meeting that, uh, you know, it could be a cool night um, um, for, for town meeting or whatever. Um, those are my concerns. As far as the specific issues uh, of the items uh, on the town meeting agenda, I will, we are going to, uh, we're going to have an opportunity to speak to each of those at a later time. Is that correct, Mr. Barrett? Yep, for sure. We'll we'll go through them all individually and and debate the merits and discuss and ask questions. So, okay, that's all. That's yeah. the sum of my comments. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you, David. Okay, and so then to to wrap that up, uh, Jim Johnson. I guess the only question I had is. Um, specifically referencing the articles that need to go to the planning board and require a uh, public hearing. Uh, is that a notice that can only be sent to them once the warrant is closed? Or do we, do we know what the legal procedural um, way to go is there? We did some digging on this over the last couple of days. Um, okay. And so I believe it is once we officially get... Um, we're going to mark it as of the time we received the citizens petition, Cindy Hoag's, um, because that has to do with um, uh, zoning. So there's really three zoning articles that are on there. It's um, the parking, 
it's the um the housing one in the over the, the actually it's four it's the overlay district for hardwood engineering also in the one that uh, mike and ashley worked on so we have a letter ready to go that we're going to send off tomorrow okay so that doesn't require a vote of this board in order to do that no it requires notification okay. and I uh, see. you you and ashley worked on that yeah right today Okay. So do Great. you want to make a motion to close the 2020 fall town meeting warrant? So we have a second. Open. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> we have a motion and a second. We will now uh, have our roll call vote to close the town meeting warrant. Jim O'Neill. Aye. Nancy. Aye. Mark? Aye. David? Aye. And I-500, the fall town meeting warrant is now closed. 500, all right. Moving forward. Vote request of Gina Rodriguez to use Adams Farm on September 5th, 2020 for a birthday celebration. Trusting that the board members have read the application in their packages prior to the meeting, I would open it up to discussion if anyone had any or accept motions. I'll make a motion. Nancy. To approve Thank the you. request of Gina, Rod Gina Rodriguez to use Adams Farm on September 5th, 2020 for a birthday celebration, subject to them complying with all COVID-19 guidelines that are in place at the time of the event. I hope the numbers go up and you get to have a bigger party. I'll second it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, now we will take our roll call vote. Jim O'Neill. Aye. Nancy. Aye. Mark. Aye. David. Did I misread this? Was it for a wedding or for a birthday? I don't Birthday celebration. Okay. I thought it was for a wedding ceremony only. Was, am I missing? Is that another application? Um, can, you, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, um, so, yeah, so they had originally applied back in March to have a wedding um, and they ended up changing it. They reduced the numbers for the wedding and then ended up changing it again. I'd put a memo in to say that they're now just going to have a birthday celebration instead of the wedding. Okay, yeah, because I'm looking at the application, it says wedding ceremony only, which I was happy with that it was just going to be the ceremony, not even a reception. Um, um, and that's saying guests for the event are 80. Okay, all right. David, to clarify, that's why we added to comply with all COVID-19 gu um, guidelines, because those numbers can change at the will of the governor. Or I shouldn't say at the will of the governor, um, science based on the numbers that the governor then decides to change. Okay, thank you. And your vote would be, David? No. No. Then, yes, four, one, zero. The motion passes. Would you like me to make a motion to ratify and sign the mem memorandum of agreements with the DPW union, the clerical union, the library union, and the police union? Yes. Yes, please. So moved. So moved. <laughs> is there, is there, is there further? Yeah. Is there any uh, further discussion from the members on this subject? Being that there is none, we'll move to the roll call vote. Uh, no, I, 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 Oh, I, I'd like to hear more about the, the, the agreements. Sure. So Jim Johnson can answer any questions you may have, David. Why the difference in uh, 
dollar increases between uh, between the library uh, union and the clerical union. Um, all, all, all of these groups are separate bargaining groups. I can't bargain with each one of them. Um, each one of them went into these negotiations looking for something um, different than the other. Some wanted more, some wanted less. Um, we finalized the um, library union back, I think, in beginning of March, late February. Um, and this is just really the way everything worked itself out. I do believe we discussed them in executive session when we were discussing negotiations. Yeah, we've been we've been through these. Any other questions, David? All set. Okay, great. Uh, so we'll go ahead with our roll call vote, being that there's a motion and a second. Jim O'Neill. Aye. Mark. Aye. Nancy. Aye. David. No. Ben, yes. 410, the motion passes. I'll make a motion um, to approve the request of Davino Winery for annual weekday entertainment license and seasonal weekday Sunday live music license. I'll second that. Being that there's a motion and a second, any further discussion from the members? Being that there is none, proceed with the roll call vote. Jim O'Neill. Aye. Nancy. Aye. Mark. Aye. David. Aye. Ben, aye. Five zero zero. the motion passes. I'll make a motion to the naming of the Route 1A field complex to be South Walpole Sports Complex. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion from the board members? Being that there is none, we'll proceed to a roll call vote. Jim O'Neill. Aye. Nancy. Aye. Mark. Aye. David. Abstain. Ben. Aye. Four zero one. The motion passes. Thank you, Nancy. Move to the consent agenda. I will make a motion to accept a um, donation from Nadim Yanis and Rumania Alam to community policing for fifty dollars. Did I say that right, John? Was I close? Yeah, sounded good to me. All right. <laughs> I'll, I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. We'll proceed with a roll call vote. Jim O'Neill. Aye. Nancy. Aye. Mark. Aye. David. Aye. Ben, aye. Five zero zero. The motion passes. And we are now at the town administrator update with Jim Johnson, just a hair before 918. Sure. Go ahead, Jim. Just a couple of items at this time. Uh, COVID update, we uh, we have 273 total confirmed positive cases in Walpole. Uh, 268 cases have completed monitoring. Five cases are undergoing monitoring. Just to give you some perspective, two weeks ago, um, we had uh, 263 and we only had uh, three undergoing monitoring. So our numbers have gone up by about 10 over the last two weeks. Um, uh, town meeting, I, I talked about town meeting a little bit during the warrant. Um, as soon as Dan makes the call on what he's comfortable with, um, you know, obviously I'll keep the board involved in that and uh, what we're doing going forward uh, with everything. Capitals already started meeting. Um, Ed Fosberg uh, is the chair once again and uh, he's plugging away. Um, the, for the most part, that committee is intact from what it was last year. Uh, so the members uh, have been on there for a little while. Uh, MSBA update. Uh, I spoke to Brian Jarvis regarding the, the middle school project. Brian explained that the project is moving along. Um, uh, Compass is working on uh, gathering info on the various sites that are being considered. Next big item is the education program, which needs to be developed with the school officials and the consultants. But 
Um, Brian and his team understands all the work that uh, Bridget and her team are going, putting uh, putting in with the new school year and everything and the hybrid learning program. So um, that may take a while. Uh, the fields project, that project continues to progress. The turf was placed down for the first field about two weeks ago. Crews continue to stitch the numbers and the lines in on those fields. The second turf field, uh, I think it they might have started it this week, laying the grass, the, the green down for that one. Um, work on the grass fields continues to progress. Last week, they uh, had the backstops in for the most part with the poles, uh, and the drainage was getting finalized. Uh, it's expected that they're going to start spreading the loam this week or next, and seeding in the grass area is expected to take place in early September to catch the good growing season. So uh, much more to come on that over the next upcoming weeks, and that's about it for me. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks, Jim. That's fantastic. Yeah. Any uh, board members have a question or comment? Nancy? I have one comment, and I just want to give a little public service announcement of my own. I have spent from mid-March till mid-June completely exposed all the time while I'm at work to COVID patients. It's been in the air. I do procedures in high aerosol, intubation, extubations of patients, COVID positive patients, known patients, in and out of rooms, putting IVs in, taking on and off my PPE. I have not so far gotten COVID. I don't have antibodies. I, I've had antibodies checked twice, have not had antibodies. My PPE has worked. I have a nurse friend who I grew up with in Walpole who lives in Rentham who pretty much does the same thing that I do and was the same way until her daughter went to a high school party and caught COVID there and drank out of her mother's water bottle and her mother caught COVID, my friend. And it can happen that easy. PPE is important. Our families, our loved ones, who we bring it home to, it's, it's serious. I've never, ever, ever worked in a hospital that has had over the last 30 years, the entire hospital filled with the same diagnosis. So it's not fake. It's definitely real. It's sad and scary because it kills people and you don't know who it's going to kill. Yes, it has lingers with comorbidities comorbidities of diabetes, hypertension, obesity, but it also kills people that you don't think it should and you don't think that it would and they're extremely healthy. So as we start to go back to school and we get our kids together and it's going to happen in small cohorts, big cohorts, they're going to be kids. They are going to do what they want to do. They are going to do what they can try to get away with. No matter how much parenting we do, even though we're all stuck at home, they're still kids. And even kids that are their parents, they know what their parents have been doing. Um, but just remember and take care of our elderly, take care of our family, you know, take care of our family members that are on medications that put them at higher risk. And, you know, hopefully, you know, we'll get there someday, but it might just take a little while. And we've done a really good job so far. Walpole has less COVID patients than the hospital that I, um, less COVID positive people than the hospital that I'm employed at as far as employees caught. So, you know, keep doing, keep plugging along everybody and we can get there eventually. That's it. Thanks, thank you, Nancy. Yeah. Really well said, Nancy. Thank you. And thank you for everything you're doing. Uh, while I'm at that, we've got the chief, uh, Chief Carmichael and Chief Bailey was on earlier. I mean, you guys are all heroes in my book. So thank you. All right. Very good. Uh, we are now at the point in our agenda where we will be uh, in moving to executive session for purpose three to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation, if any open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the same uh, in the position of the public body and the chair so declares. 
and we will be uh, exiting this Zoom to have our uh, executive session within a separate Zoom, and we will not be returning to the public Zoom uh, until our next regularly scheduled meeting. So be that as it may, uh, we will take a roll call vote to move to executive session for that purpose. Jim O'Neill? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Mark? Aye. David? Aye. Ben? Aye. Five zero zero. We'll now move to executive session. Thank you to those who have watched. Have a good night. Good night.